information gets disseminated at that, so that is an important meeting. And thank you very much. Thank you. And now to our speaker, Professor John Patrick, who was the orthopaedic surgeon at the famous Robert Jones and Agnes Hunt Hospital, and later was Professor of uh, uh, Orthopaedic Engineering at the University of Wolverhampton. Maybe he will spend a, a little word explaining why an engineer is also a surgeon. Uh, since retirement, Professor Patrick's interest has turned to medical history in the form of the Black Death and the Plague. Could it be that any lessons learnt from the past might be pertinent in today's uh, uh, epidemic of uh, Ebola virus? Who knows, maybe it is all relevant. So, Professor John Patrick, please. Well, good morning, after such a nice introduction. Thank you, Vivian and to all of you for inviting me. Yes, indeed, I am retired <laughs> from the orthopedic hospital where I worked in a little bit of engineering. Engineering is as wide or wider than that. And the way that you and I walk has only been discovered and known about uh, from an engineering principles point of view since about 1952, 1952. So, with the modern advent of computers, we've been able to do an awful lot of research to find out how you and I walk, and latterly how animals walk, how we run, and so on and so on. Look at what happened at the Olympics and the Paralympics. A huge amount of knowledge, and I was privileged to be able to help the understanding of the pathology of so many conditions that affect human walking, and that's what I did. It was a life, it was a wonderful time that I spent in the research laboratories at uh, the orthopaedic hospital. Anyway, I'm here to talk about something completely different. How did I get into this really quite gruesome subject? I have no horrible slides, I can promise you. <laughs> um, really because uh, most of this is ancient history and there were not really very many uh, pictures, certainly no photographs obviously, not even of the outbreak of plague in Madagascar in 2008. So it's not yesterday's disease, it's around us. And I hope that at the end of the next hour you'll know a little bit more about the condition of plague. I got into it because I uh, used to be master of the Shrewsbury Drapers Company, a charity here in our town, in the county town, which looks after alms houses and alms people. And the master, about four years ago, the, our chief, asked me, because it was the 550th anniversary of the Drapers Company, if I would uh, please look into the medical aspects of this curious catastrophe that hit Europe in 1348. And I did, and I gave a talk then, and have done on several occasions. And it's that same talk, somewhat elaborated, uh, particularly in view of the point made by Vivian about <coughs> Ebola, Ebola virus, that I'm going to try and help with the understanding of this morning. But first, we have to set the scene. We're talking about 1348, as I said, the mid, what, a third way along that century. At that time, Shropshire was covered in forests and wood. Every so often, there would be a clearing, a man-made clearing where there would be a farm, a hamlet, a load, L-O-A-D, as it was called then, where people lived in little grimy hovels, uh, really very close to each other. They were the peasants. They were part of everyone else. The people who owned pretty much everything in those days were the nobility and to a lesser extent the church. All of us have vague memories of this, those that are uh, not historians but learned about feudalism when they were at school. I'm not uh, a historian and I, there are going to be historians in this hall who actually will pick up things 
and be wanting to criticize. Please don't. <laughs> remember, <laughs> remember that I'm uh, not a historian. But to push the picture a little bit more, uh, we had at the time a very small population. There are all sorts of arguments about how many people lived in England in, 13, in the 1340s. The arguments need not concern us, but there are such people as archaeological statisticians who have gone into all the figures that are known. And I can't believe it. What, five minutes ago? Oh, there it is. Okay. It is known, certainly, that there were four million, it depends which expert you read, it might be as many as six million people in England. Uh, depends how people were counting, because there's no hard evidence. The hard evidence arrived at the time of a poll tax, poll tax census in 1377. And that number, 2.25 million, was the population of England, is pretty sound. Everybody's agreed. Whether a third or a half of the population died as a result of the plague in England uh, is not exact knowledge. But we do know that in London there were 40,000 people, it was the biggest city by far in the whole country, uh, ecclesiastical cities, uh, certainly those closer to uh, church buildings and trading centres like uh, York on the rivers, Bristol, Winchester, were all big-ish, but York was next after London in size. So far as it is able to be calculated, Shrewsbury had about three and a half thousand people. And we'll come back to that later. But really, everyone else, apart from the nobility and the churchmen, lived in these small clearings where there were subsistence farmers. Small, little tiny groups of hamlets, but the same hamlets and small villages that we know in Shropshire and across England even today. And in that, there was this medieval society, and particularly it's important for me to put over to you how unwell the vast mass of the population of the serfs was. <coughs> they managed their lives, but we know from all sorts of clever modern um, uh, measurement techniques that they were a pretty unwell group. People now can analyze what is in the bones of people discovered at the bottom of plague pits. And they were all of them showing a great deal of evidence of chronic disease, particularly of malnourishment. They had low vitamin D levels, low calcium levels. They were osteoporotic. That's a, uh, a word we all know. And they were um, chronically anemic. So they didn't have much in the way of immunity from almost anything, even the common cold or flu. As well, a lot of them had to go at the drop of a hat almost to follow their liege lord into battle as soldiers, certainly all the young and fair. <coughs> so they were maybe suffering as well in 1348 from the effects of a lot of wars that their king took them to. And here he is, Edward III. He was on the throne at the time. He took over the throne really by uh, at the age of uh, 14 in all sorts of curious ways. I'm not a historian, but he stole into, I think it was Nottingham <coughs> Castle, through some uh, uh, back door entrance, and arrested Mortimer, who was his mother's lover, it would appear, and had him arrested, and he later was executed. Then, uh, this boy, and he was just a boy, I suppose, um, started on changing English history. He, we know about it, he didn't at the time, but he had a lot of presence, very obviously. And he was able to uh, nip up to Scotland and created havoc up there, subjugated them once, twice, three, four times, many times, in fact, in the next 10, 15 years. And then he uh, decided that 
with <clears throat> the King of France at the time, another young man called Philip VI, that together they would go on a crusade on the instruction of the Pope to the Holy Land. But Philip VI of France decided for whatever reason that he would start supporting the Scottish. So there were lots of wars in northern France in particular. And we all have heard, not of Hallidon Hill, but we will all have heard of Cressy, where the English long bowmen, these same serfs, Cheshire archers, many of them, were able to completely trounce the French army. Uh, all of us are aware of that, I'm sure. Neville's Cross, where is that? Well, the Archbishop of York, the English Archbishop of York, who had been appointed by King Edward, took a, an, another English army north into Scotland and s smashed the Scots again in the same year, in 1346. At the end of all this warring, people then had to start returning to these same feudal occupied uh, lands. This serf army divested itself of its uh, longbows and returned, much the worse for wear. And I don't mean through drink, but they were in armies of that time right up to really the present day almost, likely to be suffering more chronic diseases. There were outbreaks of cholera that are known about, or at least it's assumed it was cholera. They suffered from typhus. That's from fleas. You scratch them and you get a really unpleasant illness. So there were lots of reasons why that population of soldier serfs were undernourished and not a well group of people. There's a sort of facsimile, really, a photograph of a modern-day serf. <laughs> but um, we all are aware of strip farming and, and our sort of ancient history for us that we learned about at school. But particularly, they lived alongside their animals in tiny little hovels with thatch roofs. They worked extremely hard, and they were sort of owned by their liege lord. They had to ask permission to get married. They had to ask permission, written permission, to go to the next door county to visit a relative. And they lived in dreadful conditions. We can all imagine that. We've all seen enough programs on the television. The average age of death was quite late, around 38 years of age. But that's not because people all died at 38. But it was in those days because there was such a high uh, infant and child mortality rate. So those that survived into their teenage years would likely live to at least 38. There are many 50, 60, and even 70 plus year old uh, persons, although a lot of them were of the noble classes or monks and nuns in monasteries uh, and nunneries. But the point I'm trying to make is that serfs were therefore more susceptible and there must have been flu outbreaks uh, and cholera outbreaks that decimated local populations. But suddenly something else arrived. The Black Death. It wasn't called plague until about 200 years, no, 100 years later, in the 14, mid 15th century. It arrived at a place called Malcolm Regis. Where on earth is that? It's still there, a tiny area just to the north of Weymouth. Weymouth today is quite a big port, those of you who have visited recently will understand. It's a sort of spit of land that sticks southwards, and it uh, acts as protection for a, a hinterland on the eastern side of the river there, where um, people could, in medieval times, safely take in their boats out of the bad southwesterly gales and have uh, a place to land a cargo. And that's called, or was called, Malcolm Regis. A lot of uh, trade, international trade, was done by the Genoese. The city of Genoa in northern Italy is today a city that's reinventing it itself. It has to, because it was a huge industrial center for um, 20th and 19th century Italy. <coughs> 
But in the Middle Ages, it was one of the most important city-states in the whole of what we now call Italy. And Genoese merchants took their boats all over the Mediterranean basin. And they particularly went to uh, the Crimea, and I'll come back to their city. They built a fortified trading city on the northeast coast of what is now the Crimea, called Kaffa. And it is to there that caravans from the far east and from the Arabian and uh, Indian peninsulas arrived with spices and silks. And the Genoese made a huge and very lucrative living out of trading those goods from their city, a fortified city in the Black Sea, right out over the Levant and the Mediterranean basin. Unfortunately, when those two ships arrived, two barks arrived in June of 1348, not only did they have this normal trading cargo, but on board they had the black rats. And within three or four months, it had spread along the south coast, all the way up into Kent and into London, arrived there in the winter. It went towards Bristol in the southwest. It spread like wildfire. It had spread right across Europe like wildfire. And we'll come to some of the no longer theories as to why that might be the case in a few minutes. The result of all of this was ghastly. The country and all the countries of Europe, Western Europe, Central Europe, were devastated. It is definitely agreed by historians of proper repute, unlike myself, who are able to tell us that at least a third of the English population died within weeks. The evidence is patchy, though. But, for example, at Crowland Manor, uh, which is in Lincolnshire, the, the whole of one manorial set of villages disappeared. Tilgersley in Oxfordshire disappeared. All of the population of those small villages, maybe 30, 40 folk, all got the plague, all died, and those villages were never, never repopulated. However, it was a sporadic attack by this disease. Some places like in St. Albans, just north of London, as we all realize, we see it on the, as we go past on the M1, they were only slightly affected. Why would this be? Well, I hope to be able to show you that. One of the things that is most definite and really quite understandable, but still remarkable, is the high mortality rate in any of the cathedral cities. Why should so much death have happened uh, in such places, all of the big cathedral areas. Well, of course, we have to remember that in those days, religion was the most important thing. It took over <coughs> everything. You depended upon your parish priest for help, for succor, for support, for his or her or <coughs> his pastoral care. And when your family fell sick of a disease that you didn't understand, but which we knew by reputation was alarmingly horrible, you called in the parish priest. And if you were higher up the pecking tray, uh, chain, you called in the bishop, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Archbishop Stratford, Stratford died in 1348 of the plague, because they were doing it their duty as churchmen. So it accounts for this very high death rate that we know about. We know about it because in all of these um, uh, records that pe historians can look at, it's the church and the intelligentsia, the monks who are writing all of this down. The common man did not know how to read and write, so that evidence is missing. What is this thing? What is the plague? A long last I've got down to it. It was known then as the Black Death because there were plague tokens all over people's bodies when they got to the what's called the septicemic 
stage <coughs> of the illness. That was just prior to death. And that's where the plague bacillus, because that's what it is, as you can see on the left there, that's a scanning electron microscope of Yersinia, the plague bacillus. That's what it looks like. When that miserable, wretched bacterium had got to every single blood vessel and caused the blood vessel to burst, if you like, and cause little hemorrhages. When they, all these tiny hemorrhages in the skin coalesced, they would get, they would get um, little bruises, and these would amalgamate one with the other, and then there would be black, uh, dark blue bruising of the skin. And that's how it got its name, the Black Death, because that very quickly especially if death was just a few hours away in many cases, that's what caused the sign of the plague token, and it meant death. That germ is a bit similar to Escherichia coli, E. coli, of which, or Clostridia. Those are the things that we know about today. I hope you can hear better now, but realize there was a lot of echo in, uh, to my voice standing a little bit further from the microphone now. But it's a, it's a cousin of E. coli, and it's still around. Obviously, I mentioned Madagascar, but in North India today, you can capture, as rodent operatives do, capture black rats, and there will be a cinea pestis in the black rat stomach. We live in that part of India in a sort of uneasy relationship with the animals and with that bacterium. It's still in our society. Fortunately today, it can be treated, let me assure you, it can be treated with a lot of support and with antibiotics. But then, nobody knew what I'm telling you. Can you imagine the fear, the terror amongst populations? Suddenly, an illness hits your village, your town, your hamlet, and people are dying left, right, and center, and you don't understand that it has anything to do with the sudden appearance on the streets in your own homes of black rats dropping out of the thatch onto the pavement into the floor of your house. There was no ability to connect the two, but the black rat had got black death, the same Yersinia germ, and was dying from it. So there is why, is it coming? Can you see? There he is. That's Rattus Rattus, the black rat. One of the reasons why uh, plague is no longer as important uh, an international illness today is because the black rat has been superseded, superseded uh, by Rattus norvegicus, which is the brown rat. And the brown rat doesn't like to live in close proximity to humans. It still feeds in much the same way on human detritus, on rubbish and rubbish tips. But the black rat likes the warmth of the company and the food supply that the medieval peasants' hovel would provide. And we all have images, don't we, of every morning you open the windows and you took the chamber pot and you dumped it out the window into the open sewer, which was the street below. Well, again, that's something that the black rat made its home. It needed to be that close. The Norwegian rat, the brown rat, doesn't like that. He likes to be at the bottom of the garden, hiding in its burrow there, and venturing out when it feels safe to do so. All of this brings me to him. That is the rat flea. Now, there are countless numbers, almost, of rat fleas. But that particular one is called Xenopsilia cheopsis, and it's species specific for the black rat. The brown rat has his own group of Xenopsilia fleas, but the Norvegicus uh, brown rat doesn't have a flea that carries Yersinia. And it used to be called per Pasturella pestis until the 1950s. It's been renamed after Dr. Yersin, who was working 
in the Institut Pasteur near Paris uh, in 1894, as you see. And he was able to make the connection of the circle to the three elements, the rat, the rat flea, the germ, and the human. And I'll come to the latter point in a moment. But we have this miserable looking tiny, tiny flea, about the size of a comma on your computer screen or typewriter, lives in the fur of the black rat and has to feed. And what does the rat flea do? But it bites. And when it bites, it can't get a proper feed unless it injects below the skin of the rat and the human. It has to inject some saliva. In the saliva is an anticoagulant, which we uh, chemists and pharmaceutical uh, investigators have certainly investigated. And some of, not the rat flea, but some of these uh, anticoagulants have been used in humans, or at least the way that they work chemically has been used to advance medical knowledge. So there is something to be said for it, uh, uh, at the very least. Anyway, as it bites, it injects its saliva containing the anticoagulant. And if the rat, its host, primary host, is suffering from Yersinia bacterial infection, then that rat flea will very quickly also be uh, contained, its gut and its saliva will also be uh, containing the Yersinia germ. And it, so it's going to inject back into the black rat a small amount of the same germ, the Yersinia pestis. And that's what, we're, that's what actually happened. In times of uh, some warmth, and when there's an explosion of numbers of black rats, because maybe it was warm and they were overbreeding, then they would start to boom in their numbers. Consequently, there will be a lot of um, fleas and the fleas would want to go either to a nearby person or if there weren't any nearby, uh, they would do that if there were no nearby rats. What the rat flea would much prefer to do is to stay in house, so to speak, would like to stay uh, on its preferred host, which is a black rat, 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 ratus, ratus, the black rat. But if the black rat is dying in countless hundreds around in that little tiny hammock. It's got to feed somewhere. And unfortunately, we are the animal that it chose, or it chooses or chose then. Why? Because it's you and I have the same core body temperature as the rat does, curiously. So the flea, Zenopsilia, does not choose a horse or a cattle passing bullocks, dogs, cats, it chooses the nearest thing that it can sense in somewhere where it's going to be safe. It might even, I suppose, confuse the passing human for another black rat. So it either jumps onto another black rat, but if there aren't enough black rats around, because they're all dying of plague themselves, then it has to get to something else in order to survive, and it jumps onto the nearby bare skin, bare skin, of a nearby human. Now most of the nobility and the church were not exposed in their extremities. They didn't have bare skin, they had stockings and all the rest of it. Big boots, perhaps. So when they actually bite the nearby person, then the Yersinia germ can get going and it can start to infect the human. At the time of the bite of the flea into the human, it's going to inject, it is calculated, in that little tiny dribble or drop of the saliva, it's going to inject into the person around 15,000, only 15,000 of 
the Yersinia pestis bacterium. And initially, the peasant might just you know, brush the leg, swipe where he's been bitten. We all have been bitten by little mosquitoes and things, haven't we, as we travel around. You, you can sense how that occurred. And that particular man or woman or child feels okay. Oh, it's just another bite, you know, pleased to that sort of thing in the Middle Ages. But things worsen from that moment onwards because within a couple of days that particular person is extremely ill with a very high fever, uh, very toxic, stopped being able to eat or drink, and they are really really unwell, prostrate, being put to bed and being nursed by other people, probably family members. And then suddenly these things appear, that's how it got its name, buboes, bubonic plague. What are buboes? Well, that's actually, the, so, um, you can't see the buboes, but you can see perhaps, I hope that there's not too much light here, but you can see little black spots of the septicemic part of the plague, where the bacillus has got into so many uh, millions and trillions of uh, capillaries, uh, the tiny little blood vessels, that all of them break down and these black spots appear. Um, we'll go into the other methods of spread in a moment. The spread is not into the arterial system, the red blood, or even into the blue-blooded venous system. It's into the lymphatic system. So we have a bite, say, down here on the bare skin of the lower leg or the foot. And that tiny little skin injury of the bite is where the disease may start. Locally, the human, even the medieval undernourished, a uh, poor resistant human will mount a resistance to that infective bite. All sorts of white blood corpuscles and immune systems start to be brought forward to try and resist the infection. But Yersinia pestis is also on the march and he goes from 15,000 to trillions within hours. And part of that is a lot of tissue breakdown at the site of the uh, rat bite, or the flea bite, sorry. Um, but also that Yersinia is now being entering this third fluid transport system called the lymphatic system. We all have that. And when you have had, in the past, think about it, a sore throat, you get glands swelling in your neck, don't you? and it becomes sore. That's your lymphatic glands acting as a filter against the invading whatever it might be that gives you the sore throat, yeah? And it's the same thing in bubonic plague. But these lymph glands in the groin or in the armpit are the second line of defense, and they really work hard to try and contain the infection and they get bigger, and they get bigger, and they get bigger. And one of the things that was understood in the uh, 1892 to 1901 outbreak in Madras and Calcutta, that sort of area, uh, at the end of the 19th century, was how painful these buboes were. Nobody could have appreciated the screeching pain of this swollen lymph gland, or swollen lymph glands, because we all have many of them. And they all are fighting for space, and they are swelling and getting bigger, and more and more uh, involved with a failing defense against the Yersinia pestis bacterium. So that's how it gets into <coughs> the main fluid transport system. <coughs> Because by the time you've got buboes in either of those situations, because of a bite in the periphery of the ankle or in the forearm, you're not likely to survive, though you might. That's uh, an old woodcut of dancing on the grave. But we have to think about who got the plague. 
and I stressed in the earlier part of what I was saying a while ago that it was the uh, the poor, the undernourished, the peasants, the serfs, the soldiers who'd come back from France or from Scotland, but certainly those who were chronically ill. And that's been shown because people um, have now started to dig up with the Crossrail project in London, uh, entrance points to the subterranean railway tunnels. And they've gone to the squares, Charterhouse Square, um, Barclay Square. A lot of those places are built as squares because in the middle of the squares there were plague pits known about. And so that was banned for building. And archaeologists have been part of the Cross Rail project to try and discover a lot more about this catastrophic illness that hit London uh, in 1348, and again, of course, in 1665. What we have found, or what they have found, is that these were itinerant people who had gone to London, presumably to earn their fortune or gone for trading. They were youngsters, they were mainly male, they all all had some sort of chronic illness. They were malnourished, they had they were anemic, they had low vitamin D levels, etc., etc. So they were ripe for the picking, if you like. And to some extent, we had known that for a long, long time. Elizabeth Carpentier in the 1950s made this rather neat uh, statement, plague was a child of famine. And indeed, we can understand that there were plenty of famines to add on to the malnourishment of the medieval serf population. One other factor to note was that from 1348 onwards, it became endemic in the population. By endemic, I mean that plague had arrived. There were subsequent attacks all over the place, perhaps coinciding with warm weather when the black rat could multiply. And as it did so, then more and more fleas, obviously. And then there would be outbreaks in various places. There was one in Windsor, where Queen Elizabeth I had fled in total panic with the court in 15-something. I can't now, the, the date exactly uh, escapes me. But she issued an edict. She was so frightened, perhaps because of her knowledge of her own hereditary problems. She was so frightened that she forbade anybody to enter Windsor without a pass to show where they had come from, and anybody who came to the gates of Windsor, who had an address in the city of London, was hanged immediately. <laughs> no trial, nothing. The word soon spread around. So it, that's what endemic is. It stayed then and kept bursting forth in different attacks from then on, right up to 1911 when there was an attack in uh, Suffolk. But that was traced to a couple of grain ships arriving again with our black rat uh, from Argentina. Um, so it was known about. The very last attack in England was at Porton Down in, I think, 1958, and that was in the experimental laboratories there. Something went wrong with the um, uh, precautions being taken in the laboratory where Black Death was being ex uh, examined, or Yersinia. So we have this stage where at the limb roots, the, uh, in the groin or in the armpit, these painful buboes um, swell and swell. People get uh, very, very ill. They're toxic. They're very unwell. And in the Middle Ages, people asked the surgeon, idiots like me who didn't know any better, and I don't, to come along. And you see this enormous, horrible, swollen thing. And you seize the sharpest knife you can find. And it, hoping that that will release the, the, the miasmas, the, the, the fluids, that the person will get better unhappily. It soon became apparent that that was a death warrant. Um, 
And indeed, if they burst themselves, they would probably, uh, I don't want to go into it too much, but very close to the lymph glands are the main arteries and veins to the leg, you can imagine. So apart from the sickness and the fever, you are pretty soon dead. It takes around seven to 10 days for normal immunity to build up. And Yersinia was foul enough as an illness to actually get you dead before you had time to mount a proper immunity, except that quite a lot of people did. If a third of the population died, then what about the other two thirds? Well, some of them must have been of group A, although a blood group A, which actually is immensely protective against uh, getting a plague, would you believe, is extraordinary, but there's one of those odd facts they're good for trivial pursuits, I imagine. Um, but if you had group A, you were more likely uh, to survive. If you had a strong immune system, and nobody knew about that, but some people do and some people don't, you might survive. And if you were lucky, you would certainly uh, perhaps avoid being bitten. I only put that one in because there's... Uh, a little bit about the 1665 um, outbreak in London, and the great diarist then was Samuel Pepys. And Samuel Pepys was inspecting naval stores in Portsmouth. The weather was bad, and he had to go to an inn with one of his fellow inspectors to stay the night before travelling back to London. And the two of them had to sleep in the same bed because there was no other room at that pub. And he wrote in his diary, the fleas came to him, but not to me. His friend died of the plague. So luck was something that was in how you uh, avoided um, getting the illness. If it had got into the lymphatic system, which I've been talking about uh, perhaps a little too much, it would then go on into the lungs. And it will go into the lungs directly because somebody coughed at you and their uh, coughing breath as they coughed out at you. Remember, if it was a family member, you would be likely to be quite close, helping them to maybe drink or something of that sort. And you would then inhale the droplets that they're coughing out and the inhalation, even if it wasn't uh, their sputum, would be a culture of Yersinia, and you would inhale it. And if you did that, you had pneumonic plague within 48 hours, and 49 hours later, you'd be dead. So that was the worst way. And it's that that, we, that modern historians, medical historians, I may say, use now uh, only in the last five or six years to explain how the Black Death and how the Great Plague of London killed so many people so quickly. Not this long rigmarole of fleas and this vector and that particular cycle, but when quite a significant number of the population had got the disease, they would then pass it on very, very rapidly to uh, family members, to the visiting priest, to the visiting doctor or nurse. And so uh, it would then kill uh, in that fashion very, very rapidly. And it was rapid. Remember, I showed you the slide where from Dorset to London, it made the trip in six months, ravishing, desolating the population in that time. And in those days, it took probably three or four days to get to London if you uh, went on horseback and longer if you walk. Where did it come from? Uh, importantly, I hope you can see there, this is a, a Catalan map, a reproduction on the side of a Catalan map from 1311. So it's in our time. And you can see, I think, that the Black Sea is oversized, and certainly the Crimean Peninsula is definitely oversized, for the scale of the whole of the European maps. And that's because on the northeast side of it, there was this town of Kaffa that I've already mentioned, 
where the trade routes from North India, from the Arabian Peninsula, from China, all, or a lot of them, arrived. Because they, the merchants from the Far East and from Arabia, wanted to sell their wares to somewhere in a marketplace. And the Genoese, from Genoa, Genoa is there, had this enormous number of sailing uh, vessels and went to Kaffa, built this, themselves a fortified city <coughs> there. They were a bit fearful of their neighbors, uh, just as Putin is today. But, <laughs> um, but they traded there. And then into their boats went these precious cargoes. And unhappily, after 1347, uh, an additional extra cargo of rats. And we know it was there then. And we know there are sporadic um, as more and more information is assembled, there were um, knowledges uh, written of sudden pestilence which hit people on the caravan overland trails uh, before uh, people got to Kaffa itself. It came to Istanbul in 1347. It then, by ship, spread itself all along Asia Minor, down the Levant, along North Africa, into the Iberian Peninsula, and of course into the mainland coasts of the Adriatic and the Italian coast, and to Genoa particularly, and it then spread on the overland route. Um, we've already said about how mortal it was. I wanted just to take you through one or two quotes that I've found. This one here, so great a pestilence before this time had never been seen. So great a reminder, is that what, does that what you're yeah. so, so great a multitude was not swept away, it was believed, even by the flood that happened in the time of Noah. It was a major desolation of England and indeed of Europe. Henry Knighton, uh, the canon of Leicester Cathedral, writing in 1351-52, said, it's rather plaintive, really, isn't it? There was such a dearth of servants and laborers that men were quite bewildered as to what to do. <laughs> but to put that in to try and bring your mind or concentrate your minds into the effects of this awful catastrophe, because that was the beginning. The Black Death was the beginning of the changes both in parliamentary democracy in our country, beginnings of the end of the feudal system. There was a peasant revolt in 1381, where a lot was promised and not much given, but a hundred years later, it had happened anyway. And there were major trade changes as well, because there weren't enough people around. There just weren't. And the uh, surviving laborers and their children as they grew up suddenly started to realize that they could demand more money for their labor and for their time, and that they didn't necessarily have to be the Lord's man and stay in their village and ask permission for almost everything. So there were big changes afoot. We don't have much evidence, because there wasn't any time to have evidence, if you like. Um, Yersinia pestis was such a rapid uh, illness and killed in this pneumonic form through the lungs from droplet infections of people coughing or breathing over uh, their family members or visitors. It was such a quick thing that there wasn't any time for things to be uh, painted or written down. But we do have one. Boccaccio was a young princeling in Florence in that year. And he, for whatever reason, we don't know, he took some friends, some young mates, drinking pals perhaps, up into the hills to the family estate. And they spent 1348 and the beginnings of 1349 up on the family estates away from Florence. But they were interested in what was going on. They had family, presumably, in the city. And they rode down and were horrified by what they saw. He, Boccaccio, wrote this book, The Decameron, which is a very major um, source for historians. 
He said lots of things about how useless religion was, how nobody had any cures. What I thought as a doctor, or a retired doctor now, was what he said about the medical profession in the day. Neither the advice of physicians nor strength of any medicine was of any value or had any effect. Uh-huh, okay. <laughs> Less uh, pleasant and really a bit ironic though was the uh, diary um, left by Dr. Francesco Dovini, who was uh, a monk and a doctor, that was often what monks did. Um, he was in a Florentine church, Santa Maria Nuova. I hope my accent is reasonable. Anyway, one of the big uh, hospital um, um, monasteries in Florence. And he did post-mortems on people who had died from the plague. It would not surprise this audience, nor me, to know that he contracted the disease, but he continued to write. And he wrote and wrote and wrote. And the last page that we have of his writings is a spluttering of ink. And presumably he dropped to the floor, unconscious, in the middle of a sentence. Oh, goodness. In Ludlow, there were some other similar examples, particularly one I brought, bring to your attention. In 1349, at the end of the year, people uh, had applied to the court for some retribution, for the judge to make a ruling on a particular matter. And he wrote out the case because neither the appellants nor the defense could appear they had all died. People did try all sorts of things. They put on scourges to try and um, self-hurt themselves to remind themselves that they must have sinned. The um, things that they did were probably of no good effect. Certainly poses and burning fires and all the things that were tried then did not work. But what did work, and it was common sense really, was that people were placed in pest houses if they had a temperature, if they were looking ill, or probably if their neighbours were uh, didn't like them any forward on them. You know. but, but that's what's happening now. We see it on our television screens, yeah, in West Africa. So they also made bans on travel and taking in lodgers who you don't know and don't know where they've come from. They were quarantined. Uh, bases around all the English ports. There was a big island uh, uh, near Canby Island where ships had to s register and stay moored for three weeks to ensure that nobody had got the plane. And if they had, the ship obviously wouldn't move at the end of three weeks because all on board, presumably, would be dead. Those sorts of quarantine ideas are exactly what's being used today and tracing of contacts. So how did it affect uh, Shropshire? When it came up the 7, the M5 of its day, um, from Bristol. I told you Bristol was affected. And we do have evidence here of lots of um, benefices uh, that, became, that fell vacant in 1349. It didn't start in Shropshire until 1349, but we know from figures that of the different um, Where's much why not there, up at the top? But there were 52 parishes that were advertising in, in, in ecclesiastical terms for a new vicar, please, a new priest, because they had that number of vacancies. Strangely, though, in Shrewsbury, there were no obvious signs of the plague, or at least not initially. But recent research in the last 15 years have shown that in the Archdeaconry of Shropshire, some up, there were, amongst the clergy, the same third 36% of deaths. Uh, work done by uh, a colleague of mine now, I've become something of a friend of his, Professor Bill Champion, there he is, who has helped and did his PhD on what was going on in Shropshire in, in the archives of Shrewsbury Library. But he showed that the numbers did fall 
he particularly I want to introduce this one to you. He found evidence, written evidence, that in 13, uh, uh, in Fish Street, about the number of fishmongers who were trading there. In 1343, according to what they wrote it down in then, called the Curia Generalis, there were 16 fishmongers who were trading. In 1345, just before the outbreak, that number had varied, it had gone down to 12. Unfortunately, he doesn't have the figures of 1350 or 1360. The earliest he can find is the early 1400s. But in the three years around 1406, 1407, those numbers of fishmongers trading successfully in Fish Street had dropped by approximately half. Similarly, lawsuits in Colum. Owen and Blakeway were some Victorian historians who published in 1829 about, they had found written evidence from the borough of Shrewsbury at the time that they were going to appoint themselves, uh, to themselves emergency powers, which would last for two years to stop, presumably, people traveling or people disposing of the dead in, in a particular way or whatever it was. We don't know what it was that they found, annoyingly, and the archives have been searched and presumably either Owen or Blakeway, these Victorians, took that material home with them, worked on it, and then forgot that they got it. Oh, how many other researchers in this room have got annoyed with that? I certainly have. But in 1349, there was sufficient positive thinking in our town here that the Shrewsbury Drapers Company commissioned the beginnings of the build of the Trinity or Drapers Chapel on the south side of the transept of our beautiful St. Mary's Church. So something was afoot, and it wasn't plague and doom, it was a positive thing. There is a point here that that needs investigating, and I would love to do that research. I've looked into it. Um, Bill Champion has said, well, you have to know how to understand medieval script. I can't, and it's a completely foreign language to me. If there's anybody in this hall who might be interested in helping in such a thing, who knows about medieval writing, perhaps they'd like to come and speak to me afterwards, we could get together and do something, I think, of some importance. It did affect uh, lots of parts of Shropshire, the church and the parish records all um, show this. Um, I mentioned that there were lots of um, almost advertisements for new priests. The one from Lillishall Abbey, uh, the biggest abbey hereabouts in, in the 14th century, they are of great interest. They used to let out their forest land for wood gathering, not for tree gathering, but for the underwood, for their boughs and branches that had fallen onto the ground, or for the dead trees that had fallen over in a big wind. And that land was theirs and remained theirs. But if you were one of the local serf families, you could go pay a small sum to the abbey and then go into the forests and gather dry wood for firewood to last you through the winter, or indeed through the summer, I suppose, because wood was the main material. So we have evidence that their um, business it there, I think, um, was dropped so that their forest land was worth very much less, as you see there. Also, we know that it must have been affected by the plague because uh, there are, according to ground radar, there are some plague pits in the little heavy grounds. Farm rents dropped a lot. The one I want to bring your attention to is the one on the bottom there, the Whittington Estates. I used to drive past Whittington Castle every single day on my way to Oswald Street in the Orthopedic. And when I discovered that they couldn't let their farmland because they needed 40 shillings to repair the castle wall, that put it into perspective for me personally. Because I knew that, that castle, and I knew that English Heritage about seven or eight years ago now, spent a small fortune 
on uh, shoring it up and repairing it. We did have a number of plagues. I said that it was endemic in our uh, county after um, 1348. Here's an example of some writing in 1584 outside the immediate period, but it gives you another sense of what was going on. Plague was in, on in Oswa Street, so that a market, in wool that was, was kept at Nookin. Uh, some were saying Nookin, wouldn't they? And by the, the drapers of Shrewsbury did early every Monday to resort to buy their, their cloth. I think that's really nice. But anyway, a final point really is about English sweats. I only put that in because it just gives you, if I explain what it is, it gives you an example of what historians are up against in trying to decide if death rates and burial records mean that everybody had plague or whether they had something else. And English sweats came over or became, came into the records uh, when Henry Tudor came up from Pembrokeshire, stayed the night, we're told, in the Lion Hotel, etc., etc. But his men were billeted all around the town, clearly. And they had undoubtedly what is now called and known to be a hantavirus affecting them because everywhere that small army, as it, as it got bigger and bigger, going towards Bosworth, everywhere they stayed for the night, people unexpectedly died when they came into contact with parts of this army. And when the new Henry Tudor who had been crowned king on Bosworth Field, got to the city of London, the mayor knew which side bread was buttered on, and he and his old men and his committee and all the rest of them welcomed the new king into the city of London. And within a week, the Lord Mayor, his deputy, and five other aldermen had all died of this English sweats. What is it? It's a virus which affects a small, sometimes a large population, and just kills people stone dead very, very rapidly. It happened to several uh, American uh, platoons and slightly larger groups in the Vietnam War, so they looked into it. But it is interesting that it's another example of the rapid death rate amongst a population <coughs> where nobody has any idea what's happening other, what, other than people have suddenly died. So you can understand how medical historians are forever trying to make some understanding out of bald figures, particularly, you can imagine, of death rates and burial records. The only other thing to say about um, English sweats is that Arthur Tudor, that's King Henry VIII's older brother, died. Yes, we all know about that. He died, undoubtedly, of hantavirus. So, it has got something important to say. A last slide. In the 1665 outbreak in um, the city of London, 100,000 people are pretty much known to have died. That's been verified as a figure, 98,000, somewhere around that. In present day terms, proportionally, that will be 5 million people dead in the city of London, if that repeated itself. And that's where Ebola comes in, does it? We hope not. I leave you with that as my final slide. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for listening. Question, if anybody wants to ask anything at all. Yes, please. I have an understanding there's still a residual population of black rats suffering the wolves of London. Is that so? In the, the question was, are, is there a residual of black rats in the wharfs of London? In the docks, the black rat. Uh, black rats are still existent in the United Kingdom, yes. And whether they have Yersinia pestis in their guts, I do not know. But I would imagine, just thinking about it, that the public health authorities would have had a good go at capturing a few and just testing. <laughs>
I hope so. <laughs> That was most informative. Thank you for all the detail you gave us and the quick run through history, which is not so easy at all. But a wonderful speech. Thank you very much for your energy and effort. Thank you very much, Professor Patrick. December and it's our Christmas doom at the Lord Hill Hotel, 10am.